Module 8, Measures of Dispersion or Interval Estimates, Section 3, SEM, CV and CD. So first is SEM, what is that? It is nothing but standard error of the mean. So as we have already seen the standard deviation, it quantifies the scatter or the variability of the measurements in a data set, right? But in the case of SEM, it doesn't portray this variability at all. But sc standard error of the mean quantifies how precisely you have determined the true mean of the population. So the, the population mean is something in, uh, entirely different while you what you're working is with the sample mean. So the sample mean might not be same as that of the population mean. You know, so what is the difference between these two things? So what, there might be a margin of error. So that error is what is being captured by the standard error of the mean. So uh, standard error of the mean can be computed by the equation, very simple equation that is standard deviation divided by root n. So if you know standard deviation of the data set and if you know the size of the data set, you can calculate the standard error of the mean without knowing the, the raw data. So the raw data is not really required in the case of quali you know, the, the computation of the SEM, but for the SD, yes, you need to have it. So if the SEM is presented, but you want to know the standard deviation, just multiply the SEM with the square root of the N. So if the N is given and SEM is there, but you don't know the SD, just multiply to get it. Just the, uh, the other way around from the same equation, you can do it. So SEM by definition is always smaller than the standard deviation. So SEM gets smaller when N gets larger. So SEM is always smaller. So some people have a preference that instead of going for SD, because it has a lot of variability, people will prefer to display SEM, which is wrong. That is actually cheating. Because SEM do not portray the scatter. SEM portray how precise you have determined your sample mean with respect to the population mean. So SCM and SD are entirely different things. So you cannot substitute SCM for the SD to get a narrower range uh, to, to, to show to the public that you have your data is fantastic, but that is an incorrect. That is actually a, a wrong, unethical practice in sciences. So my word of caution is that summarizing raw data in a set of numbers may not be informative at all and might even be misleading like as I told you the SCM instead of ST. So that is totally misleading and especially the truth that if you do not write what the error bars are in the figure legend. So you have to write down what the error bars are in it. So my advice is that if the N is less than 100, instead of portraying all these numbers or summarizing everything that do not convey any meaningful information, it's always better to present each and every value in a scatter plot. So column scatter plot would be my recommendation. And if the N is more than 100, so the data becomes so exhaustive in the scatter plot, the best option would be box and whisker plot with uh, the outliers clearly marked in uh, the box and whisker plot. So if you want to show how precisely you have determined the sample mean, the best est estimate would be sample mean plus or minus 95% CI instead of going with the SCM, that is standard error of the mean. Let us have a reflection point here. Calculate the standard error of the mean if SD, that is standard deviation is 10 and N is 25. How will you calculate? If you wish, you may pause the video right now and come back it later. Well, SCM, as I told you, it is standard deviation divided by root n. So you can calculate it from just with this data. You don't need the, the, the raw data to calculate the standard error of the mean. So to calculate is that the standard deviation is 10 divided by root n. So n is 25, root n is 5. So 10 divided by 5 is nothing but 2 is the standard error of the mean. So you, you don't even need a pen and a paper to uh, write down this calculation, you can really do that in mental uh, calculus, mental mathematics, it's a very simple one. Next is coefficient of variation, what is that? It is a ratio of the, you know, the standard deviation to the absolute value of the arithmetic mean expressed in percentage. So it is a ratio of standard deviation to the arithmetic mean, but remember the mean can be negative, but you are not taking the negative in this case, so it has negative become positive because this is an absolute value of the arithmetic mean. So SD is equal, standard deviation divided by absolute value of the mean is a coefficient of variation and most of the cases CV is presented in a percentage. So also known as the relative variability, this the another term for the coefficient of variation. So the equation is SD divided by 
mu, well that is uh, has to be the absolute value multiplied by the 100. So that is what the arithmetic mean, uh, you know SD upon arithmetic mean. For example, for our earlier data on the marks, so standard deviation had been 4.67 and mean had been 11.87. So CV you can simply calculate plug into the following equation to get you the value of 0.39 as the, the answer to it. So coefficient of variation is used to make comparison between different distributions. So if you have multiple groups and multiple distributions, so if you want to compare across the distributions, so CV is a very good tool. For example, the variations in the tail length of the mice and elephants, obviously elephants will have a larger tail length, so definitely the variation is tend to be much higher than that of the mouse. So if you want to compare this across these two distributions, so the CV is a very good option. Or uh, you know, uh, if you want to compare the blood pressure data with the pulse rate data, so again the pulse rate and blood pressure, uh, the variation is quite uh, uh, exhaustive. So standard deviation would be larger for elephant tail as well as the BP data simply because you know much larger measurement scales being used for these two data sets. So CV would be similar and hence more meaningful if you would like to compare these two distributions. So coefficient of variation is used for only for the ratio scale. So it is itself is a ratio and you should know that it is not used for interval or ordinal scale only for the ratio. So it is actually meaningless if it is in temperature is in degrees Celsius or the Fahrenheit but it is okay if you express that in Kelvin. So also meaningless for the pH. So of course the pH scale do not fall under the ratio scale. Coming next is CD or coefficient of dispersion. Coefficient of dispersion is very simple. It is the ratio of the square of the standard deviation. So the, if you square the standard deviation, you will get the variance. So the you know, standard deviation is nothing but the root of variance. So the variance to the absolute value of the arithmetic mean sometimes expressed in the percentage. So instead of SD divided by the absolute value of the mean, here it is SD squared divided by the absolute value of the mean. So you should know that it is absolute value. It, it never the CD, neither CD nor CV can ever get in negative value. So it is a... Uh, uh, not the negative value. So this is also known as the CD also known as the dispersion index or variance to mean ratio because you now numerator is variance, denominator is uh, uh, mean. So variance to mean ratio or VMR. So uh, that is what it is, right? The, the formula used is SD square divided by mu and you can multiply with 100 as well. So the, the, uh, the coefficient of dispersion is very important because the value will tell you what kind of distribution uh, the, you know the, your data set follows. So if you are getting 1 or if you are getting less than 1 or more than 1 or 0, you can make inferences about the nature of distribution by looking at the CD. So CD informs us how spread out the values in the data sets are relative to each other. The spread is also being measured by the coefficient of the dispersion. So for example, if the data set A has a CD of 0.5, while the data set B has a CD of 0.1, then data set A is 5 times more scattered than the data set B. So now uh, uh, a quiz to you, the quiz is that you know the penicillin, penicillin is an antibiotic. So its antibiotic is nothing but antibacterial chemical produced by a living organism and which is serendipitously discovered by Alexander Fleming in 1928. So after some 10 years, penicillin resistant microbes were reported from around the world. Now most of the pathogenic bacteria are resistant to the original penicillin uh, component. So we need a structural modification to the penicillin now. So which among the following is true regarding the penicillin resistant bacteria? So what is actually something to do with the penicillin resistant bacteria? Which among the following statement is right? Statement A is that they existed before the invention of penicillin. They means penicillin resistant bacteria, you know, existed before even the invention of penicillin. So penicillin was invented in 1928. So these bacteria were already existent by then before the invention of penicillin. How is it possible? Now B is they evolved after the invention of the penicillin. So penicillin resistant bacteria evolved. So that came in existence after the invention of penicillin. What do you think? Which is the right answer? So it might surprise you the answer is A. They existed before the invention of penicillin because you know 
these mutations in our DNA is not in response to the selection. So selection simply takes whichever the mutant is best fit. So that is the one simple uh, but profound uh, concept of the natural selection by the Charles Darwin. You know variations are spontaneous, the mutations occurring in our genome is extremely spontaneous so there is no control over it, right. Uh, it caused by the mutations in the DNA which is not directed by environment. So many people think that these mutations are directed by the environment. So all nature does is to select the best fit variation, you know. So this is being uh, proved by uh, you know the Luria and Delbru Max Delbruck and Luria. So this is a very famous test in genetics in 1943. It's called the fluctuation test of Luria and Delbruck. So what did they do that? So they actually did the culture, the, you know the microbial culture. So they have the bacteria. So they repeatedly transfer the bacteria into different, different, different cultures and then re-inoculated into a fresh batch of the broth. And finally what they did is that they plated these bacterial cultures into plates, the agar plates containing bacteriophages. So the lawn of bacteri bacteriophage is nothing but a bacterial, uh, it's a bacterial virus. So phage is a virus. So the plate contains the lawn of bacteriophage. So you are plating your uh, bacterial cultures into it. So what will happen is that there are two scenarios. The first scenario is that if the bacteriophage is causing these bacteria to evolve, for the resistance. So then you are going to see the halos, you know, in approximately same number of halos in different plates. So what is this halo? Halo is nothing but clearance, you know, bacteriophage resistant bacteria can grow on it, right. So otherwise the, the bacteria cannot grow onto the plates because the phage is nothing but virus, virus can kill the bacteria in it. If you see the bacteria growing on a phage uh, plates. So that means that these bacteria are resistant to the bacteriophages. So in the first scenario you are expected to see the same number of you know the colonies appearing in different different plates. So almost similar. So it is something like a normal distribution. As you see that number of colony is, is a count. So it is like a poison distribution that is what you expected. While the scenario number two is that it is not actually induced by the media but it is pre-existing mutations. In that case, you will see extremely varying. Some will have zero while the others will have lots of colonies. So all you have to do is that, uh, you know, uh, is it actually uh, normally distributed or not normally distributed. So the distribution is what you have to check it. So you know, Luria and Delbruck, they considered that to know the distribution from which this is, comes from, the best option is to know the VMR. So is it actually one or much larger than one? So what they found is that variance to mean ratio is much larger than 1. So it is something like a negative binomial distribution. So much larger than 1 means that the variance is a lot higher. So the second option is better, in, uh, you know, that is much better explained the variability in this data set than uh, the VMR is 1. So it is not 1 but much larger than 1. So that means that, you know, these mutations are not in response to the selection but these are merely pre-existing ones are sieved or selected by the natural selection. That is what the fluctuation test is. One more uh, uh, measure of the dispersion is something called quartile coefficient of dispersion. So as you can see it is in red color so it is a non-parametric method. So quartile coefficient of dispersion. What is that? So it is nothing but Q3 is third quartile or 75th percentile you have to calculate then Q1 is the first quartile or 25th percentile and plug into this equation. So Q3 minus Q1 divided by Q3 plus Q1. So that is what you are going to get the quartile coefficient of dispersion. So it is something like CD that is coefficient of dispersion but this is uh, this does not make any explicit assumptions about the the probability distribution from which your sample came from. So it is a distribution independent method, the, the quartile coefficient of dispersion. So CD will tell you how spread out the data sets are relative to each other. For example, one data has a COD that is quartile coefficient of dispersion is 0.5 while the other has 0.1. So that means that it is five times uh, larger, you know, see QCD that is a quartile coefficient of uh, dispersion. So one example would be the class, there are two classes, class A has this set, now you can calculate the Q1 as well as Q3, Q1 is 25th percentile while Q3 is the 75th percentile. 
plug into that equation. So, you are going to get 0.5 as the you know the value of the quartile coefficient of dispersion in it. While the next class is class B. So, if you calculate the quartile coefficient of uh, dispersion into it, you are going to get 0 0.65 in it. So, the dis dispersion is larger. So, the variability in the class B is larger than that of the class A. So, such inferences you can make out by looking the quartile coefficient of dispersion. So, in summary, standard error of the mean is the ratio of standard deviation to the square root of the sample size. So, SCM is equal to standard deviation divided by square root of uh, n. So, SEM measures the precision not the scatter. So, that is extremely important for the scatter is what you want to convey then go with standard deviation rather than the standard error of the mean. So, uh, how precisely we have determined the sample mean comparing with the true population mean that is what the SEM tells you. Coefficient of variation CV is the ratio of the standard deviation to the absolute value of the arithmetic mean. So, CV is SD upon mu which is the absolute value while CV is used to make the comparison between different distributions. So, the, the coefficient of uh, uh, you know variation or the CV is used to uh, compare across the distributions the coefficient of variation. So, coefficient of dispersion that is CD is the ratio of the square of the standard deviation to the absolute value of the arithmetic mean. So, that is the only difference between CD and SD is that SD it is the square of the mean on the numerator while in the case of CV it is there is no square in it. CD informs us how spread out the values in the data sets are relative to each other. The CD is also useful measure to make informed guesses about the nature of distribution that is what the VMR is all about. So, uh, you know you will know what kind of distribution is that just by checking the variance to mean ratio or the, or the CD. Quartile coefficient of dispersion is a non-parametric measure of the dispersion values of the data set. So, QCD is Q3 minus Q1 divided by Q3 plus Q1 where Q3 and Q1s are uh, the third quartile and the first quartile respectively. So, the quartile the third quartile means 75th percentile while first quartile means 25th percentile. So, it is a non-parametric method. I hope you have enjoyed this module and I will see you soon in the next module. I just have a one request to you that please uh, look at our uh, discussion forums. So, actively contribute into the discussion forums and also I suggest you to take uh, ungraded tests. So, that will also help you for self reflection how you are progressing throughout this uh, the MOOC is. Thank you so much.